Yeah, so I'm one of, one of the Australian uh, QGIS developers. Like um, Dave said, I've been involved since 2011. <coughs> so I joined the project sort of in the middle of its growth, I guess. Um, so this is some of, the, some of this stuff in here is personal opinion. Um, some of it's just plain facts. So we'll go through it from the start. So back in the beginning, um, we got a fish. No, maybe not that far back. Um, 2002. So Gary Sherman uh, created the start of Quantum GIS at the time. It wasn't actually called QGIS, although the code references QGIS. So official name is Quantum GIS. Uh, this is the first logo that you would see if you started it up in the title bar. Um, I went back in the code to find the rendered little uh, animate or icon. If you check out the, the first commit that was ever made in the project's history, which is this commit up here, that's the entire code base. Like most projects, they start with small beginnings and don't, you don't just dump a 10 million line file into a project and go done. Um, this is also the readme. Uh, I can assure you it doesn't look like this now. It's a lot bigger. Um, and you can also say it's very uh, humble, I guess. It doesn't have any functionality. It's basically just enough to list the tables in a, in a PostGIS a database. <clears throat> and to build it is three steps. It is definitely more than that now. Um, maybe on less, maybe on Linux it's three steps, on Windows it's definitely not. So there's 2,700 lines in the source file. That doesn't include the README, that's just pure, pure code. Um, and it was started, if you know what the history of QGIS is, is just as a, a PostGIS viewer. Gary's past experience was Esri and he moved to Linux and created QGIS to be able to read PostGIS layers because there was no, no viewer at the time. <coughs> so it started as a hobby project, as like most things do. Sometimes just throw code out there just to see what happens and announced onto a mailing list basically that was there. Um, however, most things tend to change over time, um, whether on purpose or not purposely. This is the tre like Google Trends essentially um, of the achievements in the project's life going up to three, four, so it's quite out of date. But you can see the, gr the quite rapid growth um, after, after the two releases. So this kind of change brings more people, more, more developers, more community members, um, and it's pretty much inevitable if you've got a project that actually does something well, which is what Gary created originally. <clears throat> so where are, we, where are we basically now? One of the biggest open source GIS projects, there is a few others, um, um, there's a, I can't pronounce it, so I'm not going to. There's another one that's quite, probably just as large in terms of code, but uh, it's definitely not as prevalent as what QGIS is. It's definitely not lo no longer just a PostGIS viewer. As you know, it opens almost every format you can possibly poke a stick at, thanks to um, GDAL, as well as SQL and Postgres and WMS and all those fancy, f and even ARC. Um, it's also got a very, very extremely large community compared to some other projects. And uh, that includes actual users and developers, basically. So as Niall said yesterday in his lightning talk, there's 170 contributors to the project, plus all the translators and documentation writers. Um, so it's quite large. It also has a lot more stable and frequent release cycles now than what we used to have in the past. Back in the early days, it was kind of whenever it felt like cutting a release was when we cut the release. We'd cut one right now. Um, so now it's a lot more structured and lot follows a lot more um, a frequent pattern rather than just sporadic. And better code stability and unit testing and automated builds and installer packages and documentation and translation and a fancier website, um, things like that. It's also quite large code base. So it's almost a million lines of C++, which is hairy. And also uh, 500,000 lines of XML. Well, we don't write that XML, that's UI files, so they're generated. But still, it's in the code base, regardless. There's also Python and Perl and Shell and Bash and every other language you can also poke a stick at. So there's experience, a wide range of experience in the project in terms of growth, in terms of developer growth. If you touch the QGIS code base, you may be doing Python, C++, and Perl all in one day, which is probably true of most projects. So that all basically means we're not pretty much in Kansas really anymore compared to what we used to be. And of course, all that does come at a, at a cost to the project. It's not free. As soon as you've got a large code base, nothing is, no, nothing is free. Even a small code base, nothing's free, but the more things you add, the more cost there is. And that's not necessarily cost as in dollars, that's cost in time and energy and resources 
and uh, stamina to, to stay motivated, basically. So things that cost us, you know, code changes now require more thought because the project is larger. So you have to think about your changes more. There's diversity issues, as you would have seen Lightning talk last night, yesterday with my Santa hat. Um, changes re require thought rather than just sporadic cowboy coding and who cares what happens, basically. Um, documentation definitely doesn't write itself. It's an issue that we've currently got and we still have and most projects will always have it. Even enterprise paid solutions have that problem. You have to maintain documentation. It's just a fact of life. There's also now a bigger barrier to entry. So as the project's grown, the code base has got larger, which means more tooling, and we have to rely on a lot more tooling. Onboarding people becomes harder. So those things just naturally grow out of a larger project. Um, and there's a mix of funding and volunteer. Early on, it was pretty much volunteer. 99% of my work was volunteer. Most of Niles' work was volunteer. Most of the developers' work was volunteer. And it's grown into a more sustained project with funding. Let's go on to talk about installers for a minute because you can't just do a source dump when you're this large. Back in the early days, it was just a source dump. There was no installer package. If you want to QGIS, build it yourself on Linux. Probably no Windows package. Definitely no Mac package. You're on your own, pretty much. It doesn't fly when you're a large project. There's expectations around um, being able to install it. And if you can't install it, people just won't use it. And then your project will probably die. Hopefully not die, but go slowly away. Um, so making installer package is pretty easy, right? You just do it, um, but it's really not. <laughs> it's really, really hard, um, especially because of the amount of variables that are involved in, in making an installer package that actually works reliably, has to be automated, so you don't have to do it manually every time. And there's also the problem of works on my machine but then doesn't work on someone else's machine. And we've actually had communication issues. As the user expectations have grown through the project, as the project's grown, People expect to be able to install it on, on OS X, on Windows, on iOS, on Android. So communication around what we provide from an installing package point of view um, hasn't always been super clear. And that's purely a, com a communication issue. And an example of this is a Twitter exchange that I was part of late on, but someone was saying that the Mac, Mac packages sucked and we should be ashamed as a project to have crappy Mac packages, which... <coughs> is not necessarily a lie, right? So a few people got involved. As Twitter's conversations usually go, they went to crap pretty quick. <laughs> it involved people saying, well, if you want better Mac packages, you should just install, like, shut up and sponsor it yourself. Turns out there already was a sponsored installer package that the QDOS project had actually funded. You'll see in a minute how much. And it was pretty much ready to go. The difference is we hadn't communicated that it was ready to go. It's sitting in a repository waiting for that final cutover to the website to say, we're done. No one had been prepared to make the call for that for ver various reasons. So after that conversation and an after I dug into the, re the real issue, not the issue that it's not funded, it's the fact that it was funded and just not published, we um, just made the call to publish it. And now it's better, hopefully. It's better. But there's still issues, of course, because installs are hard. But communication is key there, ultimately which also comes into this. People rely on QGIS for the daily work. They expect the installer to work the next time they run it. If I install 3.4 and then I run 3.6 install, I don't expect it to just suddenly break everything that I had installed. Um, so it makes things trickier. When you make installs, you have to make sure they work. When you do bug fixes, you have to make sure that they don't break existing functionality. And then inst stability also is that point. Just you have people now expect the project to be more stable for every release. If we're making it breaking things constantly, then um, people will not use it. Um, we only have a reputation like we have now purely because of the increased stability, and that comes at the cost of slower rate of change, potentially, or more ha harder changes, um, but more thought out. <coughs> support is also important, like we said yesterday in, in the talk that we gave uh, at the start. There's a myth around support, but as the project has grown, that demand and that cry is definitely always been that, always will be, as most people who use open source are aware, you can't ignore that. You have to provide some level of support, whether that's commercial, whether the project itself takes on support. If you've got your own open source project, you may decide to just do support for people and make the, make the project do the support. Um, 
but you have to communicate again where the support is. Otherwise, people will just assume it's like a most like most open source projects. You're just on your own, and um, there's no support. Talking to a few people as well about um, the project, and it's not a negative. It's a it's a good thing ultimately. Is that predictability of the as we've grown, we've learnt that predictability is a good thing. If you're growing, if you are growing a large open source project, predictability will help you a lot. People expect. People know when the installers are coming. You can go on the QGIS website and you'll see a little ticker at the top that says next release in 10 hours. Like you know when the release is coming, um, give or take some hours depending on the packaging. But you, we know when the releases are coming, we know when the L next LTR is. Um, so my advice if you are growing an open source project is to definitely get in some sort of predictability. When we used to have sporadic releases and chaos, no one would ever know what the release cycle was. It was just whenever we felt as developers was good, which leads to scope creep, like most software projects. And as we've grown, coming back to stability and also coming to predictability, we have to avoid those breaking changes. We made major breaking changes in QGIS 3 with the conversion to PyQt and uh, Qt5 and Python 3 and a few other little API things in there, GDog upgraded and things like that, that quite substantially hurt the community, I felt, at that time, because people weren't expecting an API change, right? We communicated it, probably didn't communicate it well enough, and then caused a bit of pain to people are really only starting to migrate. I've got a project that I've maintained for a long time, only I started to upgrade mine, because I didn't want to have to deal with the changes. So, as the project grows, if you're growing your own open source project, if you're on an open source project, if you want that stability and that predictability, you pretty much have to avoid breaking changes. Um, uh, it's just a standard software practice kind of thing anyway. Um, you're going to end up with gross APIs, but sometimes uh, that is life. <laughs> Unless you're forced to, like we had no choice. Um, so that, what happens basically when the project goes from being a hobby project and turns into a, a serious project that people expect to deliver serious results? People use it for research, publications, for academia, all that kind of stuff. It's not really a hobby anymore. Like People make money out of QGIS in their jobs, and as developers we make money, and as re researchers you make money, or as journalists you make money, um, and there's people who use the outputs for humanitarian reasons. So we have to produce results that are expect like predictable and um, not just sort of willy-nilly, whatever we feel like. So as part of that, as the project's grown, we kind of, the project grew to the point where users demanded that m more stability and more predictability and more structured approach. I think it's inevitable that most projects go down this route. I don't know any other communities, even in the program world, like with Python and Rust, all those, they tend to all form some sort of organizational structure. Even if you're an open source project, you have an organizational structure, even if you don't admit it. Um, so a board was established with voting members. They rotate through, like we saw this morning, to keep uh, burnout low. If you're not feeling like you're comfortable in that role, you can bail out. We also have quite substantial income compared to a lot of other projects. This is 2018's income, uh, 150,000 euros. We are quite privileged to have that amount of money. That's come over time from sponsorship, donations and things like that. But we also lose a lot of money. So we have money in the bank, but we spend a lot of money. 2018 expenses. There's a massive chunk here for bug fixing. So the project itself actually invest money back into the project to bug fix, because we realize that people expect stability, so therefore we spend, spend money on stability, on stability itself. There's other things like translations and documentation, things like that, and grant projects to fund uh, work. So the expected income for this year is 194,000 um, euro. It's, it's an estimate, it's not a fixed amount. Um, but you can also see 76,000 of that is going out to, it's not 76, Euro, about 76,000 euro, um, is going out to, oh, we could spend $7 on bug fixing. That's, <laughs> that, that won't get you much. Um, probably nothing. But 76,000 is bug fixing, just bug fixing on the project, including GDAL. So the QGIS project itself helps, would like to maintain our upstreams. There is no point QGIS just being off its own world and treating other projects themselves and let them deal with the problems. Like we realize that QGIS itself is relying on GDAL, it's relying on PROJ. Those projects are fundamental to what we do, so the bug fixing flows down. We have 
developers that work on GDAL, Proj, and QGIS in their day jobs, so we might as well just let them fix across the project. It helps everyone. If you're using GDAL by itself, you get those bug fixes. That's the whole point of being a uh, community. Um, and then upstream bug fixes to QT. QT is actually sponsored by an uh, organization, but it's an open source project, so there's bugs in there that affect us, so we might as well just spend uh, 7,000 euro on that. Talk about money some more. The line between volunteering and paid gets quite blurry at times. Um, when do you volunteer time versus when do you hunt for money? If you're relying on for a day job, it's you have to hunt for money, obviously. Whereas I may have a job that pays quite well, so then I can just volunteer. Um, but that bug fixing money also, you have to work out who gets paid for that, basically. User perception. Um, come, back, come back to the start about having installers and being more professional. Being more professional, don't ever, ever, under any circumstances, shame users for their choices. Um, I've seen it in the past, being sh shaming users for particular operating system. If you're a hobby and you're only one user, one developer, and it's your project, fine. But when you're a large project, like we are, the, you have no choice. You have to, users will come to you with, with Windows, and whether they should get a, a release for that for Windows 95, probably not, right? But that's Microsoft's problem, not ours. But don't, we don't shame them for it. You don't want to shame people for it, or their choice of operating system running on a Mac. Um, they're not, you're not any better for running Linux if someone runs Mac, right? Developer and user experience will definitely matter. The build yourself is fine for developers, we're used to it. But as a user, you can't just say, build it yourself, fix your bug yourself and go away. Like, there's gonna be differing experiences there, so be prepared to have those little bit of clashes and you have to just deal with them, but be nice. Um, so this is my final points. Um, use other projects for inspiration. I heavily look for uh, inspiration with, in the Python community and in the Rust community and those kinds of communities. Um, they're just because the ones I use. Um, and other open source, like Leaflet and OpenLayers, things like that, to see how they are doing it, to see how they're maintaining the stability and um, not doing API changes and how they're funding and things like that. Also be willing to change your project. There's no point being the big person in, in the game and then just sticking like that forever. Everything will die if you don't change. Um, we've, seen pro we've seen companies come and go like that. They dug in and then someone else comes and just squashes them, basically. So be willing to change your, everything about your project if you have to, to get um, better. Um, typical uh, sort of conferency stuff that we're dealing with all today is that the community itself matters a lot. QGIS has only grown so large because of the community we have. We have a ridiculously div diverse in terms of location. Um, we've got myself and Nolan in Australia. We've got people in Cambodia, developers, uh, developer in Japan, there's developers in America, and a lot of them in the European area. Um, but that brings as you were saying yesterday, some cultural issues that we have to deal with, clashes, but you have to deal with it, basically. Um, and also inclusion, basically. So don't, don't gatekeep people um, just because they're new to the project. Uh, I was new at one stage, and if I got gatekeeped, I would never have joined the project. Um, there's people who I've, have joined because I didn't gatekeep them. Um, they got a bad experience, and then they eventually found myself and Niall and a few others, and then eventually got brought into the project. They wouldn't be there if we gatekeep them out. Um, and, and at least be safe, don't, don't use sexist terms and gendered terms for no reason, just um, in your mailing list and things like that. But keep it as neutral as you can and make people feel safe in your environment. <clears throat> and also, coming back to everything needs money, you probably should, if you can, if you have the like, capacity, it doesn't have to be money sponsorship, it can be this kind of thing, ultimately there's just some level of sponsorship you should sponsor the projects that you care about. Um, whether that's GDAL or QGIS or GeoServer or the, the, the people who maintain the specs, things like that. Um, throw money at a problem or throw your time or resources at a problem, basically. Um, if they're not there, the projects will pretty much fade out. So, that's it. Thanks, Nathan. Time for questions. See Martin's hand. Thanks for a great talk and, and for all the work, most most of all um, on, on the project. I just yeah. Uh, I think it would be useful for us as a community to 
see back to the dire days of the early 2000s in the ArcView days uh, when QGIS started and Jump and UDIG were around as well, which were at that time, in my eyes, sort of almost leading desktop open GISs. They were somehow ahead. I have the I, ha I had the impression, and then QGIS knows it. What happened to them that they did not become so globally successful as QGIS? What is the the lesson to be learned for other projects? Or maybe it's just my bias. No, no, no. no I use you. I use UDIG and Open Jump when I first started with QGIS, and they were they were part of my evaluation of wh where I go. We can we can attribute some of QGIS' success to the underlying framework we use, um, in the fact that we use Qt, which gives us a very quick leg up compared to having to write native C plus plus, which is really hard. Um, Java, um, G like Open Open Jump was based on Java, so they've still got that kind of leg up already. I suspect it was probably the people, mainly. Um, it's not nothing against those other projects either. I wasn't involved um, in them, but I know that when I joined QGIS myself personally, um, Tim and Martin were very welcoming to take contributions. So I think the gatekeeping thing is a high risk for projects to lose um, momentum. If you gatekeep too hard, then you'll basically just kill your own, kill your own project, basically. Um, so that's probably, for me personally, that's why I think it grew. Um, it was a lot more welcoming than some of the others, possibly. Technical reasons, also speed and things like that, and it just had more capabilities, I think. Some of the stuff we could get for free that we didn't have to like, work on, the other projects may have to work harder to get. So I think there's a mix of things there. Um, yeah, it would be, would be go, good to go back and actually try and break that down more, I suppose. But I know that UDIG, it survived for quite a substantial amount of time. It's, probably, it's still around. Um, I think it's probably just a community thing more than anything else. Um, for um, those who are thinking about it and getting involved, would you say that your involvement has increased um, and y with your reputation increasing has enabled you to get higher paying jobs? So it, it sort of comes full circle, volunteering versus paid? Uh, yes. So QGIS itself was an enabler for my development path. I don't work on QGIS full time, um, paid full time. I got other, I got other priorities. But um, QGIS itself was was the gate to me being a developer now and enabling that. That. So I look at QGIS now differently to how I looked at it when I was uh, a starter. Um, I was more of a user. Um, but as soon as that as soon as that gate opened, it basically opened me to the developer community and then everything that came with that. So. I may not be doing what I do now if, I, if it wasn't for QGIS, basically. So, yeah, contributing definitely helps regardless of what it is. Even if you contribute to translation, you learn how translations work and how uh, other languages work and things like that. So.